Hi, everyone. This is the IDIS online presentation. Oh, I hope sorry. Sees Hello. My screen. Yep. <laughs> and I'm going to introduce Rob. Hi, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Sorry. I was I was on, speaking on mute. It's a little early here out in California. <laughs> Um, so um, I'm full of coffee, but uh, here we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, this uh, session of the HUD CARES Act Virtual Training Conference 2022 uh, is about uh, IDIS. Um, so uh, one of HUD's online reporting and disbursement systems, and most importantly, the one used for CDBG and CDBG CV. Uh, next session at 11.15 a.m. Eastern, we'll be discussing financial management. Please plan to stay with us. Um, sessions will continue throughout the day. Please see the event website. Um, my name is Rob Strauss. I'm with the Cloudburst Group. Um, I'm pleased to be joined today in this track uh, by two of my colleagues, Susan Walsh. Hey, Susan. Hello. And Hi. Laura Dietert. Morning. Uh, you, you may know them from IDIS. Uh, ask a question. Uh, so uh, housekeeping before we start uh, reviewing a few things. This webinar is scheduled for one hour. Oh, next slide, please. If any time you need to step away, please know that the session is being recorded. Uh, the slides, transcript, and recording will be all posted on the HUD Exchange, usually within about two, maybe three weeks of the session. You'll also find an instant recording up on the conference site uh, soon after the, the day ends. All participants today are in listen-only mode and will be for the duration of the session. Uh, note that there is a nifty feature of live captioning uh, so you'll see the show captions in the website. You can toggle that on and off to show or hide captions. And if you need more information, there is an attendee guide that you should have received. Uh, please consult that. Uh, now about questions. Uh, we do have time. Uh, we hope at the end of the presentation, we should uh, to answer your questions, at least a few of them. Hope to answer as many as we can. Please use the Q&A feature located towards the bottom of the webpage to enter your questions. Please enter them as you have them, and we'll collect them and respond to the end of the session. Uh, if you're not able, if we're not able to answer your question today, or sometimes they're a little bit more complicated than can be answered uh, right away. We need some more information, or they're very specific. So please submit those to HUD Exchange. Ask a question for IDIS. Next slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties with the uh, with the uh, website, uh, if you need help, uh, hosts uh, from CDEM are available. They'll be keeping an eye on the chat and jump in to help you. You can also send an email to event support at cdemgroup.com. You'll see it on the screen there. Please do not use the chat for questions to the presenters or to myself. We'll be looking at the Q&A only, uh, not, the, not the chat. Uh, we might drop some things in there every now and then, but if you have a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A. That allows us to manage questions. And finally, uh, next slide. If you do want to view and participate in the Q&A in a separate window, separate browser window, or on a mobile device, navigate on over to sly.do in a new browser window or install the Slido app on your device. And for this session, you'll see the code there is 720. 836, you'll find that down below in the session description. So if you want to use uh, Slido, uh, please feel free to do so and use the code 720836. And at this point, I'm handing it off to Susan. Hey, Susan. Hey, thanks, Rob. Um, so we're going to go into some information about the IDIS system. Now, this presentation is not focused so much on the screens in IDIS. It's more about just how to use the system, what is the system, what it reports to HUD, and things like that. Um, we are also going to just barely touch upon CV, but um, we did have a session on Tuesday that talked about the CDBG CV program in IDIS. And so we recommend that you consult that for uh, further information about the CV. So what is IDIS? Well, first of all, if you don't know what it stands for, it means the Integrated Disbursement and Information System. And I know that um, I, I usually say IDIS, some people say IDIS, uh, and I'm not sure if people use another term, but it's our beloved system uh, for from HUD to manage all of the CPD formula grant programs, CDBG, HOME, ESG, and HOPWA. It's also used for the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program. Uh, this has been the case for several years now. 
that all uh, Section 108 loans that are used um, for activities will then be put into IDIS. You also put in information about your loan and, um, and your repayments of your loan. Uh, the purpose of IDIS is to draw down and account for the use of funds. And so that's a very important piece of it. And also it's to collect and report information about the funded activities and also the accomplishments that you've made with those activities. So this is just a, a quick little review of uh, what IDIS is. And this, this is the bar, just the bar at the top of the menu bar at the top of the uh, system. And listed here uh, on the bullets, it's not actually in the right the exact order, but the uh, administration um, tab, which not everyone will see, but you will only see that if you're an administrator, uh, is where you have user roles and table maintenance. Um, for grantees, it's mostly to uh, assign privileges to uh, staff as needed and, um, and activate and inactivate staff. Um, for grantees and participating jurisdictions, there's a tab called grantee slash PJ, and that's where you have information about your um, particular city, county, whatever. Um, and also, that's the place where you add carrying out organizations and subordinate organizations. The grant is the um, information that tells you about the grants that you receive. It also has all of the sub funds and sub grant features, which for CDBG, um, those sub funds and sub grants aren't used very much for CDBG, but they can be used um, as a voluntary thing. So. Um, in general, probably most grantees don't use sub funds and sub grants so much for CDBG. Uh, then you have your plans, projects, and activities menu. And that's where really uh, between that and the funding drawdown is where most of your um, information is held and where you mostly will be using the system. The plans, projects, activities is where you do your action plan and consolidate a plan. The projects are part of that and, and are the the holders for the activities, and then the activities are where most of the um, information is stored. You have your funding drawdown. Uh, that's where you do your, um, create your vouchers for your drawdowns. That's where you receive from income if you have any of that. Um, and that's where you can search through to find information about past draws and receipts. And then finally, you have reports, which is a feature that ties into MicroStrategy and creates, takes the data from IDIS and creates reports um, and that information that you, that you gather for the reports are always from the day before. So reports always lag the actual data in IDIS by one day. So this isn't talking so much about the admin feature of IDIS, but just what, what are the purposes, what is the um, administration of IDIS, you know, used for? And so we have really three types of users. And if you're a grantee, you probably don't think about so much the fact that your field office staff and headquarters also use the system. But um, the grantee, of course, does their action plan, consolidated plans, that's all in the econ planning suite. And then they set up and manage their activities um, from the projects through their action plan. Um, they commit and draw their funds, they report their accomplishments, and they run reports. Now, field office staff also use IDIS, and uh, first of all, they're going to review and approve your plans that you submit through the econ planning suite. Um, they're also going to be ensuring program compliance, and that's going to be by looking at, they can see your activities, they can see your drawdowns, they can't change that information, but they can see it, and so they can read the narratives that you put in there for, for your activities and so forth. So um, they can... By doing that, they can monitor at-risk uh, grantees and activities also through the flagging feature, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and they can generate reports. And finally, headquarters staff also uses IDIS for grant administration. They input the grants into the system and uh, have different features they can use. They also um, enter or add new users to the system or take out or purge out users that haven't used the system for at least 90 days. So a little reminder to, if you use IDIS, to always make sure you log in at least once every 90 days or you'll be purged from the system. Um, 
The headquarters staff also uses it to ensure program compliance and monitor program progress, and they also generate reports. So just an overview of the whole grant management process. Um, the first thing is that you develop and you get approval of your three to five year consolidated plan. And that first year's action plan is a part of your five year or three to five year consolidated plan. And then each year you create your action plan and that describes all the projects and activities that you'll be doing um, and assigns budget amounts. And you talk about how much you're using from that year and how much you may uh, be using of funds from a prior year that carried over. After that's been approved, you'll get your grant agreements and then you'll have your actual funding for your HUD programs and you'll see that in IDIS. And then you'll set up your activities under the projects that you set up in your action plan. You'll commit funds for your activities. And then as needed, you will be drawing down those funds from those activities. And finally, you'll be reporting on accomplishments uh, as you go along, but then when activities are completed, you'll be reporting the final accomplishments. And then each year you'll be using those, um, all those accomplishments and all those narratives and all those reports to put together your CAPER, your uh, Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report for HUD. So this is um, just a little summary of the information that you had to do. And I know it says that you, um, that you will, kind of looks like you will be doing this, but I know that in probably, I mean, maybe every case, um, this has already been done. But it's a good review because if something wasn't done correctly, you can always um, go back and fix it. But um, when grantees were submitting their amendments to include their CDBG CB funding, they had to mainly go to these sections that are listed here of the action plan. And that would have been, first of all, the AD25 or AD26, depending if you were in a consolidated plan or an action, or a, an action plan that wasn't the first year. Um, you would make sure that you had uploaded your uh, executed uh, SF424 forms, all of your certifications, and also your citizen participation process and any comments that were received. And of course, as a reminder, you were asked to attach, amend that to the existing SF-424 forms and certifications. So you didn't just take away the old information and put in the new, but you actually appended the new information to the old and then uploaded that to, to the system. Uh, the other important part that you had to amend was the AP-15 section of expected resources. And that's where you wanted to add the information under other um, as CDBG CV to show that you have this new resource now um, and how much money that was. And um, most grantees got their funding in, in two kind of waves. You got your CDBG CV1 and then you got your CDBG CV3. So you had to do one amendment for your, for your first round and then a second amendment for your, for your second round of funds. Unless you just were delayed a bit and in that case you could have done one amendment for all, all of the funds. The AP35 project screen had to be updated so that you could include at least one CV project and depending on what you were doing uh, with your funds, perhaps several uh, projects. And, um, and then for states, the this AP35 screen um, and the AP30 method of distribution had to be updated. Um, now, if you find that you're reading this and you're realizing, wow, you know what, we did something incorrectly or we didn't put the projects in the right place or we used the wrong projects, just know that everything can be fixed. And um, if you realize that you did something wrong, you can always send and ask the question and we can help you with uh, fixing anything that perhaps wasn't done exactly correctly. So with, um, Activity setup, the, the first thing you do, you should have the projects already in the system from your action plan. And uh, if you don't, it is possible to add projects in IDIS outside of the action plan. But we just wanna um, mention that's perfectly fine to do that. But at some point you do want to add, amend your plan to, to tie that, add that project into your action plan so that it's tied together and that your caper will generate properly and everything will flow 
um, through the projects to um, your action plan. So um, when you do add an activity, you're going to, one of the first things you have to decide is what project is that activity gonna be under? And, and so those, um, you will do a search and you'll find those projects that you want to uh, put your activity under. You can have more than one activity under a project. Uh, for example, say you're doing street improvements and you're gonna be doing uh, three different areas of street improvements, then you could have perhaps three different activities, um, but each one of those activities is gonna be a separate, um, I'm sorry, each one of those street improvements is gonna be a separate activity, um, which we're gonna go over a little bit later. Uh, you wanna make sure that you don't just have one activity for three different areas of, of public facilities. Um, but it's certainly okay to group activities under one project if those all address the same goal. So the role of the activity is really where most of the action happens in IDIS. Uh, that's, you're going to um, set up and fund um, that activity. You're going to put a, a narrative description. You're going to answer questions as you set that activity up that, that addresses types of information that's specific to that activity. You're gonna be doing your drawdowns or your vouchers to get your funds, which um, sends that money to you in a wire. And then you're gonna report your accomplishments. And depending on what matrix code, and we're gonna show you that in a minute, but depending on what matrix code you select for that activity will, um, and also the national objective is going to uh, determine what screens are gonna be showing and what information you have to answer. And also activities, of course, are where all the accomplishments and performance measures are reported and where you can also add narratives to really tell your story um, about what you did with your funds. So IDIS matrix codes are very important because they really drive what you're doing. And as we said before, you know, that really it, it depending on the matrix code is, is gonna be what your information you're gonna be reporting on. So you need to select the proper matrix code and you also wanna be selecting the most specific matrix code. So if you, know, if you end up doing an activity and you find out that you had the wrong matrix code, guess what, that can be fixed. And, uh, and so that's a good thing, but we really don't wanna to have to try to fix that after the fact. So the, really the, it's very important to really know when you're setting up your activity, what matrix code is what I need for this specific activity. So there is a matrix code definition chart and that's available on the HUD exchange. It's also part of the IDIS manual, CDBG IDIS manual in the appendices. Um, and it goes through and the, appendix, the appendices go through descriptions of the matrix codes. Um, so you, you can really look through and see what's the most specific one. Um, because 03 for public facilities and 05 for public services do have, they both have um, one called 03Z and 05Z, which is a general category, but HUD really doesn't want you to use that unless there's just no other matrix code that describes what you're doing. Um, so otherwise you wanna use the most specific matrix code that you can. Also, if you're not sure about the matrix code, you definitely wanna check with your HUD field office because um, really the matrix code and the national objective is how this activity is gonna be eligible, right? I mean, the matrix code determines your eligibility and the national objective is what you have to meet. Um, and so uh, in order for you not to have to return funds, you wanna make sure this is gonna be eligible from the beginning. So if you're just questioning the matrix code, that might be that maybe you need to talk with your field office a little bit more about what this activity exactly is doing. So here are just some reminders about um, rules for setting up activities. These are not, this isn't necessarily information that you would always see in the IDIS manual because the IDIS manual is very helpful for the mechanics of going into the system and selecting things. But it sometimes it's, it's helpful just to know some of these um, hints about you know, how to do things properly. And one is that um, on the address screen, sometimes people don't quite understand what that's for and they'll put the address of their office. Well, in rare occasions, that is what you're gonna put. But for the most part, the, 
the address in the activity is going to be the physical address for the activity. So if it's a public facility, it's going to be that particular building or that street. Um, if it's um, uh, services that are being carried out, then it could be the uh, address of the, you know, the subrecipient that's carrying out the, the activity. But that's what they want for the address. Um, for acquisition and disposition, um, you would set up one activity for each property assisted. You don't want to combine uh, properties in those, um, in those types of activities. And also for, for um, public facilities, you want to set up, set up a separate activity for each public facility. Now, one thing that we see a lot, we don't see so much that if you have several buildings that you're working on that we don't see you know, one activity with lots of buildings and you don't want to do that. You want to have a separate activity for each building. But what we do sometimes see is people setting up, maybe they're doing a street improvement project and they're going to be working on streets throughout their city or their town. Um, and so they set up one activity for all those streets. And that's not what we want. We want to see a separate activity set up for each street or area. I mean, if you're doing, say, a few streets all together, like in a cul-de-sac or just all right next to each other, that's one thing you could do that as one activity. But if you're doing streets throughout different areas of your city, you definitely want to have separate activities for each of those streets or combination of streets that you're doing. Also public services, you don't want to have one public service activity that you're doing all kinds of different um, services. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, you can have a public service activity that perhaps does more than one type of service, but um, you would want to talk with your field office about that. Um, if one is more secondary, then yes, it would probably be okay. But in general, if you're having, you know, different types of public service activities, you want to have those as separate activities. Um, for, for single unit rehabilitation, it's perfectly fine to have um, several, um, you can, you know, aggregate all of your, you can report all of your rehabs under one activity, and there's a place to, to list all the addresses, so that's okay, or you can do one unit per activity, so that's kind of up to you. Um, but for multi-unit housing rehab, you do have to have a separate activity for each building so that you can properly report your low mod versus uh, if you happen to have non-low mod. For economic development, you want to have a separate activity for each business. This is required by the regulations. And um, I know we do see that sometimes where people um, put more than one business in one activity. So if you've done that, you will need to separate those out. So again, one business uh, for each activity under economic development. For home ownership assistance, you can do one homeowner per activity, or you can aggregate all homeowners for the program year, just like for rehabilitation. That's your option, so you have a choice there. And of course, if you're doing something that is to prevent, prepare for, or respond to the coronavirus, you will make sure that you have a separate activity if you're using, um, if you're also doing an activity that is not in response to coronavirus. You don't want to combine those two things. What you can do is if you have an activity to respond to coronavirus and you're using regular CDBG money for that and CV money, it is allowable to use to do those together if it's the exact same activity. You can put those together in the same activity if you would like and answer the question yes for respond to coronavirus, or you can have them separately. But we definitely don't want you to combine anything where it's not in response to coronavirus and something else that is in response to coronavirus. Um, a few years ago, there were some additional matrix codes added for housing counseling. And so um, this is a little bit confusing. I really encourage you to read the matrix code definitions that are in um, that are on the HUD exchange and in the uh, appendix of the um, IDI's manual. But there's several different housing counseling definitions. Um, and or I'm sorry, <laughs> several different matrix codes under the housing counseling um, especially for, you know, if it meets the 24 CFR 5.100 housing counseling definition. And so you do need to report housing counseling in that case under a separate activity. And so there is the O5Y, which supports O5R. There is the 13A supporting 13B. There's the 14L, which is in conjunction with CDBG assisted housing rehab. 
and there's a 14K, which is in conjunction with home assisted housing activities. And then there's housing counseling only, O5U. And then finally, there's an O5X, which is when it doesn't necessarily meet the definition under um, 24 CFR 5.100, but you're just doing housing information and referral services. So read that over and make sure that you understand that. Um, the O5Y is the, the counseling that's supporting home buyer down payment assistance. Uh, O5R is the actual home buyer down payment assistance. And that's as a public service. And then you have your 13A and 13B and 13A is the counseling when providing homeowner assistance. And 13B is the direct homeownership assistance under low mod housing. So again, it's a little bit confusing, but read over those different codes if you do housing counseling to make sure that you are putting it in the proper, under the proper matrix code. So your data or your accomplishments um, has to be reported at least at the end of each program year. So at the minimum, you need to report accomplishments before you, uh, at the end of your year, in preparation for your caper so that you can show HUD what you've done during the year. Um, but HUD does recommend more frequent data entry. And as we'll show you a little bit later with the flags, if you don't put information in more frequently, sometimes you do get flagged. So um, it's really encouraged in some cases to do quarterly reporting, particularly maybe for public services where you're assisting a lot of people every quarter. Um, Sometimes people will update the system with accomplishments twice a year, but um, you know, at least once a year is what you're required to do. So HUD does have a flag feature to help improve program oversight. This was started several years ago and flags can say that it can maybe signal that there's a problem. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've done anything wrong. It's just more of a monitoring uh, system to help HUD and you see perhaps something that maybe needs attention. Um, and so there's three types of flags for CDBG. There's activities that have had no draws for a year, and that kind of indicates that maybe something stalled. Um, and so that's why there's that flag. There's also flags for activities with no reported accomplishments after three years. And of course, that's also a little bit of a concern because why has there been nothing reported for accomplishments for three years? And then the last one is activities that have had 80% of their funding dispersed, but no accomplishments reported. So again, these are just three monitoring things that can indicate issues. They aren't necessarily saying that there's a problem, but it can indicate a problem. So when you're, um, Reviewing your at-risk activities, um, these, these are gonna be applied to the, the activities automatically by the system, but there is a warning message that comes before the flag becomes active. So you do get a little bit of time for a warning saying you, if you don't uh, you know, do a draw or put in accomplishments or something like that, you're going to be getting a flag. So if you get a warning flag, then it's, it's not an active flag. And as long as you do whatever, you know, you were possibly gonna get the flag for, if you do a drawdown or if you put in accomplishments, then as long as it's a warning, then that flag's gonna go away and that's the end of it. Um, but if it becomes active, it's an active flag, then that's where the grantee must provide a remediation plan for the activity within three months. And, the field office then should review that remediation plan within three months. And again, these are meant to be management tools, not necessarily compliance tools. It's just a way for to help alert you and help alert your HUD office of perhaps issues that may be happening. So each at-risk activity requires a remediation plan. And again, if, it, if it's just a warning message and it's not an active flag, then you don't have to do a remediation plan. You can just um, you know, either do a drawdown if that's needed or do enter accomplishments if that can be done or perhaps activity can be completed and that's fine. If you complete an activity, then it will disappear as well from the uh, warning message. But once it becomes active, then you do enter a remediation plan. It's not that big of a deal to do in the system. You have to just say the reasons for your delay, 
the action plan to resolve the delay. So I'm not too long of a narrative, you're going to describe what you're going to do, what steps are you going to take to, to resolve the issue, and that and the timeline for completing that action plan. And you have up to six months to um, complete that action plan. But if you can uh, complete the activity, or if say if that activity was never really used, you never did any drawdowns, and you just want to cancel it, then you can cancel it. And then there's no once you either complete or cancel an activity, the remediation plan is not needed because that activity will disappear from the blacklist. So again, remediation plans are just short-term actions um, to move a stalled activity if that's what it is forward or resolve the, de dis the delay if that's, you know, if it's been a delay. Um, and you're just, you're also gonna be providing just a timeline for wh what you're gonna be doing if it's something to do with a drawdown, you're going to just talk about how or when you're going to be doing that new, the, that additional drawdown or when you're going to be reporting accomplishments or when you expect to complete the activity. And the activity doesn't necessarily have to be completed within that six month period. Um, but just so you know, if once you submit a remediation plan and once HUD approves that remediation plan, you cannot edit a remediation plan. And then the next step, of course, is to say that you have confirmed that re the remediation actions have been taken. But we get a very common question through the ask a question where um, both perhaps you or uh, the grantee or the field office wants to update the remediation plan, make a change to it. But once it's been approved by HUD, it cannot be edited. But that's okay, you can always agree outside of the system any changes that you wanna do, that's perfectly fine. And we recognize that the system doesn't allow changes to the remediation plan. Just know that once you've submitted it and once HUD approves it, it can't be changed. Now, if the grantee submits a remediation plan and before HUD has a chance to approve it, if you want to make a change to that, you can update and make some kind of a change to it. But once it's been approved, then it is set in stone. There's a report you can run, the PR59 report, which uh, shows the at-risk activities and uh, your field office probably will be running those reports um, at, from time to time to see what's going on, you know, and to see, because if they see that there's at-risk activities, then they're going to want to make sure that you're addressing that problem, if, if that's a, a problem. <laughs> so that's what this looks like. And there's also some resources available for um, this, the whole flagging and at-risk procedure. There's, um, these are the addresses and then I'll show you at the end where you go, but um, there's also uh, frequently asked questions that talk about um, the flag system and the remediation plans. And also, of course, you can always ask a question if you have a specific question that you want to ask for yourself. So now we're gonna talk about a little bit about some reports. There's several listed here, but really the ones we're gonna look at are just the PR26 for regular and CDBG and CV. And then we're gonna look at the cash on hand report, which uh, when you submit and run the report is the PR29. So really those are the two we're gonna focus on next, but this is just a list of some common reports that are used for CDBG programs. So the cash on hand quarterly report is relatively new. It's been around for about a year and a half or so. And um, most recently, there is now a CDBG CV uh, portion of that report. And so HUD wants you to report those funds separately. So if you have drawdown privileges, you will see the cash on hand submission link um, on the left-hand side of your menu bar when you're on the grant screen. You also see a little um, red um, number one or number two that shows that you have a cash on hand report due and that will help alert you to that. Um, this report is taking the place of the 425 previously that you had done and you're going to be reporting all of your federal funds and also your local funds, your program income and revolving loan funds to HUD for each quarter. 
Now, one of the very frequent um, questions that we get about this report is uh, the fact that now when you do this in the system, you can never have a negative number on either line one, cash on hand at the beginning of the reporting period, or line 16, I'm sorry, or line um, six, cash on hand at the end of the reporting period. Um, and frequently, grantees, before they use this feature of IDIS, they were reporting negative numbers. Well, it turns out you really shouldn't be reporting negative numbers. And the reason is this. The, this is so, supposed to reflect the cash that you have that are CDBG funds. Not, and it's not a reflection of when you advance your own general funds uh, for an expense before you've had a chance to reimburse yourself from IDIS. And so because of that, you wouldn't have negative funds because the negative is really just the fact that you've advanced some of your general funds to pay invoices and pay your subrecipients and so forth. And now you're coming to IDIS to reimburse yourself. Because of that, you're not gonna ever have a negative amount at the beginning of the reporting period. It's always gonna be, um, as you know, unless you do draw your funds before you've spent them, and of course, you know, you do have to follow the rules about spending your money within the reasonable time period. But unless you draw the funds first, you're not going to have any cash on hand at the beginning or end of the reporting period because your reporting period is just going to reflect the draws that you made during that quarter. And that's the, one of the reasons that they added this feature that says amount of disbursements calculated by IDIS from the beginning through the end of the reporting period. That's a handy little feature that tells you well, this is what you drew down during that quarter. And if you always work on a reimbursement basis, then that should reflect what you would put down as your um, disbursements and also the funds you receive. So some of the things that you'll be thinking about when you do the PR29 report is, First of all, um, have you complied with the requirements at 2 CFR 200.305 regarding federal payments? This is the, um, you know, the, the general circular about using federal funds. Um, and a lot of that is regarding the fact that you need to use your program income before you're using your grant funds. So any kinds of local funds that you have, program income or refunds or credits, you always have to use those before drawing down your treasury funds. Um, have you been entering your program income and revolving loan funds into IDIS? Are, do you have a large cash balance? Well, if you have a large cash balance of federal funds, that's a problem. And if you have a large cash balance of program income, that could indicate a problem if you haven't been using it first or if it's a large cash balance because you have a large revolving loan fund, is the problem that your revolving loan fund not really active, that you're not really, you're, you're getting lots of money into it, but you're not spending money out of it. So all of these are concerns um, that, and the things that, types of things that have looked at when they look at your cash on hand report. And the data must be consistent from quarter to quarter as well, um, because, you know, just like uh, if we go backwards here, let me just go back. So for example, the cash on hand that you would have at the end of the reporting period, line six, for example, and also you have program income on line 11, then that should equal then for the next quarter, the cash on hand at the beginning of the reporting period. And I do know that a lot of grantees had asked a question, well, we were doing it incorrectly and we had a negative amount. So now our new total was different. Well, if it's, if it's not matching the previous quarter, just make sure you add some narrative in there, there's a place for remarks and explain that to your HUD office and of why your be beginning balance is not what it was at the ending balance of the previous quarter. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the PR26 uh, CDBG financial summary report. And uh, we there are instructions on the HUD exchange. Um, there's also information in the HUD trainings um, on the HUD exchange, on the, um, on the CDBG IDIS trainings on the HUD exchange. There's a section about financial reporting and there's a really good um, description and uh, it really goes into a lot of detail for the PR26. So 
between these resources, you, you, there's a wealth of information to help you with this report if you need it, because it is kind of a complicated report. Um, and this report has five sections. Um, the first is, is the summary of all of your CDBG resources. The second section is the summary of uh, all of your CDBG expenditures. The third part is the low mod benefit test. The fourth part is the public service cap calculation. And finally, the last part is the planning and administration cap calculation. So we're gonna look at each of these separately. So the first part is your summary of your resources and uh, line one is the one thing that you do have to enter into IDIS because that line is not automatically generated by the system. So there is a section in IDIS where you have to go where it says edit parameters for the PR26. It's on the report screen when you first click on the reports menu. And that's where you have to go in and add a new year, add a new program year, and then enter your line one. And I can just say that I see lots and lots of PR26 reports that the grantee hasn't entered line one. And if you don't enter line one, then your lines uh, at the end will show you your line 16 is not gonna be the correct unexpended balance at the end of your program year because you haven't included all your unexpended funds from the previous year. Um, so your line one is all your undrawn CDBG funds that were left over from your prior year. Now, it doesn't mean they're not committed. They may be perfectly all committed in activities, but anything that's not been drawn is going to be reported on line one. And then this automatic, the rest of it automatically is, is included. It will report your entitlement grant, any program income that you receded during that year will, re, will be reported. And then there are adjustment lines if needed. And if you need to make adjustments, you do wanna make sure you follow the instructions in the report. So your line eight is your total available funds. Now the next section is your summary of your expenditures. And Again, this section is all completely um, generated by the system. And it just takes all of your expenditures and reports it and it separates it by uh, your planning and admin expenditures, which is on line 12 and your all of your other disbursements that were um, on line nine. And then it also reports of, of that amount, how much has been, um, is subject to low mod benefit, which would be your project costs. And then it gives you your total expenditures. And finally on line 16 is your unexpended balance. Now, if that if everything is correct, then your unexpended balance at the end of your program year is going to be the number you use for line one of your following year, because that's what's carried over into the next year. The third part is your low mod benefit calculation. Now, if you don't use a multi-year certification, then the system automatically calculates this for you. It shows all of your expenditures for low mod activities. Um, and then it calculates the percent to make sure that you've achieved at least 70% low mod. Um, we do wanna mention here that if you have uh, money, funds that have been expended um, for low mod housing in special areas or expended for low mod multi-unit housing, then there's gonna be information on the details section of the report, the following, the, the, the pages after the first page, and you will have to enter those amounts yourself on the edit parameter screen. Um, also, sometimes this section doesn't report all the low mod activities properly if you have, if you're using a strategy area for a, for a target area. So we just wanna kind of caution you, it's, there's a little bit of a glitch in the, in the report where it really should be, but it isn't. So what we recommend is that if this isn't reporting the, the, all the activities properly as low mod, then, and you know, you may not have hundred percent low mod, but if it, it's way below what you think it should be, then it very well might have to do with either having activities that you need to enter information on line 17 or 18, or it could be about having an activity set up in a strategy area. But of course, you can always send it and ask a question if you're not sure how to figure this out. Now, if you use a multi-year certification, and not everyone does, but if in your certifications each year with your action plan, you state whether you're using a one, a two, or a three-year certification period. Um, 
And a lot of grantees don't quite understand this, but you don't have to use a multi-year certification period. That would just be if you want to average your low mod percent over more than one year, because maybe you're going to be doing a lot of urgent need or uh, slum and blight activities one year, and you're afraid you're not going to meet your 70%, but it's only going to be a one-year focus, and then you'll be doing much more low mod the following years then you can average your low mod percent over a period of two or three years um, to achieve that minimum 70%. So if you are using a multi-year certification, then you do need to enter some information in lines 23 through 26. Actually, 26 is calculated, but on line um, 23, you need to enter the years covered in your certification, and then you need to enter information in line 24 and 25. The next section is public services. And this, again, the system automatically will generate this information from your public service activities. Um, so if you don't, if it's not looking like it's correct, then it could have something to do with the way the activity is set up. Maybe you use the wrong matrix code. And so it's reporting something as a public service that shouldn't be, or maybe it's not reporting something as a public service that should be. So a lot of times when this doesn't seem to be looking correct. It could be something to do with how you set up the activity. So we encourage you to review that. Um, it calculates the, uh, it includes the program income from the prior year because that's part of your public service cap calculation. And then it calculates the percent obligated for public service activities. Now this section has uh, two lines. It has a, a line for public services unliquidated obligations at the end of your current program year. So that's where you can enter if you are not going to be, um, if you haven't spent all the public service funds, and if you're going to be spending in the next 90 days, you can always mark your voucher as prior year, it will be included and you won't have to do unliquidated obligations. But if you think that those funds won't be included in the next 90 days, or if you just would prefer to do it as unliquidated obligations and not use the prior year feature, then that's where you can enter that and it will add that into your total. And then line 29 is where you put the amount from the previous year that was on line 28. And so um, if you're not sure how to use that feature, then we recommend that you look at the instructions. Um, one thing we wanna show you is that this is the detail page um, that follows the report. And so line 27 is your public services detail. And because of the CV program, well, actually, because of the CARES Act and everything, you, you, you are allowed to use your regular CDBG funds to, in response to coronavirus. So even though there's a separate um, PR26 for CV, and we're not looking at that one right now, we're only looking at the regular one, but what now, um, because you can use your 19 and 20 funds for in response to coronavirus from your regular CDBG, this now subtotals anything, it shows any activities where you answer the question yes for to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. And then it subtotals those amounts so that you know how much uh, you spent of your 19 and 20 funds for in response to coronavirus. And then we want you to enter that on line 30. So line 30 is an adjustment uh, line and that's where you can enter that as a negative amount so that it's subtracted off to show that you are under the 15%. So um, most of the field office are, uh, offices are letting grantees know that, we, that they want you to enter that adjustment so that we can, they can clearly see that you met the 15% or you didn't exceed the 15% cap as long as you weren't using funds uh, for coronavirus. So again, this is that detail that you'll see on line, uh, the line 27 detail. Here's the section for the planning and administration cap. And this section also has the same uh, couple lines for unliquidated obligations. So if you have, um, unliquidated obligations for planning administration. Perhaps you have a purchase order for something that's back ordered and you couldn't get it in time before the end of your program year, but you're, you've obligated those funds or you have some contracts for something that is being paid out of planning and admin, but hasn't been fully um, spent out. 
that's where you can put that on line 38 to include it in your total cost for the year. And then if you do use line 38, then the following year, you would enter that same amount on line 39, um, which will subtract it from uh, the total so that it isn't counted twice. Um, there's also um, in this section, it reports the current year's program income because that's what's used to calculate your um, maximum cap for planning administration. It counts your grant amount plus your program income from the current year. And there also are adjustment lines in here if that information is also needed. There's a, a, a relatively newer report called the PR26 Activity Summary by Selected Grant Report. And this um, is helpful also to um, see about your planning and admin cap because there are now two tests of the planning and administration cap since grant-based accounting started in 2015. There are now two tests. And so this report shows all of the funds that, um, and actually this is a 2014 example, it was probably not that good of an example because you wanna use this for 15 and later, you don't really wanna use this for 14. But this is where you can see how much of your specific year's grant funds you've spent towards planning and admin, because there's a rule now that for each year, 15 and later, uh, you cannot spend more than 20% of those treasury funds, those grant EN funds, or AD if you use that, you can't use more than 20% of that for planning and administration. So um, this is a little bit of a complicated chart, so I don't expect you to um, really be able to understand it exactly. But what, it's, what we're trying to show here is uh, a little bit about the two different caps for planning and administration. So the first one is the obligation and the second one is the origin year test. So for the obligation test, which is the test that has been around forever and you, everybody should know that, that says that of your total entitlement grant that you received that year and all the program income that you received during that year, of that total, you cannot spend more than 20% of that for planning and administration or spend or obligate. So uh, obligations are really, it's obligations, but it's what you spend and obligations if you have those. Now with grant-based accounting, there's now what's called an origin year test or a grant source year test. And what that means is that for any year, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and on, of those year funds, you cannot spend more than 20% for planning administration. So if you do receive program income, what that, all, what that means is that you just need to make sure that you at least spend some of that program income for planning administration if you intend to use, um, you know, take advantage of the fact that program income gives you more planning and administration dollars. Um, so you can't just spend, if, you're, if you have a lot more money you can use because of program income, you can't just spend all that out of your entitlement funds or you're going to uh, exceed your other cap, your grant, your source year cap. I do see we're getting close to the end and we have, <laughs> there's been a lot of material to cover, but let me just go over just a couple more things. Um, this is a snapshot of the PR26 CDBG CV financial summary. It's a much shorter report. There's no line one. You don't have to enter anything on line one. It's a cumulative report. It updates uh, as you do draws, it will continue to update. And um, there shouldn't be really any um, other than uh, if you spend money in uh, for low mod housing in special areas or if you spend money for low mod multi-unit housing, other than those two situations, you probably won't need to put any, uh, or there won't be any adjustment lines available for you to use for this report. And you will want to submit this report each year with your paper, but again, it will keep updating as you spend your CV money. And then finally, when you've completely expended your CV money, you'll, you'll submit a, a final report of this, of this PR26 version. So um, this is a list of some of the resources that we have for the CDBG program. Um, this is just um, part of what's available. Um, and I wanna show you also um, one other thing, but I'm gonna go over to the questions. And let's see. So here you should see now 
This is um, the HUD exchange, and this is, these are the IDIS resources for the CDBG program. There's manuals and guidance, screenshots, and trainings. Um, and also, there's IDIS training for CDBG grantees. And if you see here, this is where on the uh, this is the landing page on the HUD exchange, and there's all kinds of training videos that are available here now, um, and they go into specific different types of um, activities, housing activities. Um, it talks about Lomod National Objective, a uh, Lomod Area National Objective, Lomod Clientele National Objective. Um, it even has information about reporting on accomplishments for each of these. And then finally, uh, it has financial information, financial reports. So this is very helpful as well um, for any kinds of um, help that you need. You can go to these kinds of resources. So uh, we're at the very end, and I don't think we have any time for questions. Uh, Laura, do you have, I'm sorry that we went so long, but do you No, I, we've been <laughs> answering a few of them um, in the uh, question and answer section. Um, oh, great. great. And so um, I think there's a few here. One might be that we can't answer is that if a grantee is not able to com complete their remediation plan by the proposed date, the six month deadline, should they just mark it as complete and talk with their HUD field office? Well, that's a very good question. And um, I wouldn't say that you should mark it as complete. So there's a place after you do a, a remediation plan, you have to, uh, then there's a point where you should be able to confirm that you did the re remediation action, but you shouldn't just say that you did it just to get rid of the flag. So if you haven't done what you said you were gonna do for for the remediation, you should not, you should just leave it and um, because we don't encourage you to do that, but you should just definitely speak with your field office and just be in touch with them. That's okay if it's still showing as a, as a, on the flag list, that's all right. As long as you're in touch with your field office and you know that you are um, working together on what you're gonna be doing to resolve the, the, the flag. Yeah, that sounds good, yeah. So the answer was especially, nope, don't. <laughs> <laughs> right, don't, don't, don't just confirm me. just because, just to get rid of that flag, right. Right, and before we're totally out of time, it might be a good time to just mention, I think you saw the resource for all the questions about IDIS setup. Um, make sure you do look at the IDIS um, guide for entitlement communities, um, because there are a lot of different specific setup instructions that go through um, on chapters three and four. Um, specifically. Yep. And okay. Well, I think we're at time. So thank you so much for joining. And again, if you have further questions, uh, you can always submit them to the IDIS Ask a Question. Great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Susan. And uh, please stick around for the next session at 1115 on financial management. That concludes our session on IDIS.